It was the early 1970s, and the entire landscape of America was transforming, whether it be on the radio with the increasingly popular funk and soul genres, or in the streets with the rise of the Black Power movement. This is the story of the Lumpen, the group that combined the two to present the ideals of the revolution to the people. The Lumpen was composed of college students turned Black Panthers, Michael Torrance, Willem Calhoun, and Clark Bailey, as well as experienced Panther leader James Mott. Panther Chief of Staff David Hilliard named them the Lumpen, derived from the Marxian term for the social scum of society, the Lumpen proletariat. The members, as listed earlier, were by no means a part of this class. However, it was undoubtedly their target audience, with party co-founder Huey Newton describing his mission as organizing the black urban lumpen proletariat. To understand the history of the lumpen, it is important to have a basic understanding of the Black Panther Party itself, as well as the greater movement it was a part of. The Panthers' overall goal can best be described by its 10-point program, which was first seen in the second issue of the Black Panther, the group's newspaper. Here is Gwendolyn Mercy Academy history teacher Carolyn Durstein to explain that program. So they create these, these 10 points, and I always love pulling number 10. I'm going to read it so I don't misspell, like, speak. Um, but it, they want land, bread, housing, education, clothing, justice, and peace. And when you think about the juxtaposition of an organization whose platform is calling for peace, but are carrying around huge guns, you know, what are they doing? Why are they doing that? Early objectives included housing and employment, as well as ending police brutality. It operated under the idea of black power, which civil rights icon Kwame Ture described as a call for black people to define their own goals, to lead their organizations. So it was really looking to um, celebrate and emphasize black culture and, and, and society, and rather than looking to become more white or you know integrate into white society, it was a celebration of black society through black nationalism. This inspired the band's aforementioned members to join the Panthers in the first place, to be a part of the revolution. Joining a band was not even a thought during their early years in the group. Instead, they performed the monotonous tasks that were expected from all rank-and-file Panthers, regardless of singing ability. One of these tasks included preparing issues of the Black Panther for distribution, made a little more fun by singing the day's popular music. The eventual Lumpen members would then put other words to the popular songs, Michael Torrance revealed in an interview. We would be singing what we called revolutionary songs to encourage us in the struggle. So if you understand the history of America and you understand America's uncom like, uncomfortable history of not wanting black men to be armed, having this organization emerge that openly uh, advocates for violence while carrying large guns, um, it really becomes a media sensation in many ways. So their message is lost because their image is so fearsome in American society. Noticing the effect the group singing had on fellow Panthers, the party's Minister of Culture, Emery Douglas, approached Willem Calhoun and asked him to make a few songs, intending to spread this energy to the general public. Douglas also realized that the Panthers could utilize these tunes to disseminate their beliefs past a local printing shop in San Francisco, where they produced the paper. Shortly after, the group would have their first performance at a small festival nearby. With the rhythm of James Brown and the message of Malcolm X, the group was a hit among regular folk and party leaders alike, with Chief of Staff David Hilliard describing the Average Panther event and its corresponding lump and concert as a way for people to be entertained but also educated. After their first impromptu performance, with the help of party leadership, the quartet could buy the equipment they needed. They formed a diverse backup band called the Freedom Messengers to complement their singing talent. Now a legitimate entity within the party, the Lumpen would perform as an opening act for the Panthers' famous activists. As Douglas expected, the music energized the people and got them in the revolutionary state of mind that would only be further honed in by the likes of Kathleen Cleaver or Elaine Brown. The popularity of the group would only continue to rise following these events. Their lyrics and vivid choreography continued to spread the Panthers' theme of revolution in a digestible way. It was in the style of entertainment that people listened to every day. However, this progress pales in comparison to the growth that would soon occur. In August of 1970, just a few months after they sang together for the first time, the Lumpen recorded two songs, No More and Free Bobby Now, 
which were pressed up as a 45 RPM record. Once again, everyone from Black Panther supporters to the people in charge of the whole operation were impressed. The record was allotted full page ads in the Black Panther. The band became performing nationwide, anywhere from Oakland to Philadelphia alongside other Panthers, never straying away from its original cause of promoting the party's ideologies. As Torrance put it himself, we never did it to get famous, we never did it to get rich. We did it because we really wanted to do something for our people and make a change. The story of the Lumpen reached its climax in November of 1970 in New Haven, Connecticut, a far cry from their start in the Bay Area. However, it was the home of Panthers Bobby Seal and Erica Huggins, who were imprisoned there as they awaited trial on a murder charge. Huey Newton said that you need to speak, basically speak to the oppressor in terms which the oppressor understood. So in many ways, they would argue that their reaction and response to the brutality that black people are experiencing in American society. So you have to remember that these are individuals who, for the most part, had family members, ancestors who were coming from the South, who experienced the lynching, the, the, the brutality. Um, the Black Panther movement would probably argue that it was in response to police brutality of, of the time. So how are you going to respond to a society that is constantly mistreating you or is violent against you while well, violence is begetting violence. It was here that the group truly represented all that it was created to be, a revolution in the form of music. Despite FBI warnings and a heavy police presence at the scene, the Lumpen played the hits off their lone record, belting out themes of freedom and possibility for all who dared to show up. It was heard by Seal and Huggins, as well as many other prisoners, who shouted back, Right on, sing the song. Right on, power to the people. Throughout that winter and into the following spring, the Black Panthers continued to feature them at major party events. However, as the Lumpen's popularity reached its height, the Panthers as a whole were nearing their lowest point. St. Joseph's prep teacher Leo Vaccaro will explain the split that occurred between leading Panthers Huey Newton and Eldridge Cleaver, which ultimately led to the demise of the party. So obviously a lot of people watched on live TV the split take place and uh, you know of course like the conversation was something that was really dramatic and something that would have been noticeable to anyone following the Black Panthers and of course the people who were in the group itself. It was even reported in early March in the New York Times in an article on March 7th of 1976 about this clash between Newton and Cleaver. So it was national news. As FBI programs continue to drive party leadership apart, the group entered its most tumultuous period. The very next day after the newspaper article appeared, so the same week as this televised split of the Black Panthers, a bunch of people in suburban Philadelphia, including a couple college professors, broke into an FBI field office in Media, Pennsylvania, and they took over a thousand classified documents out of those offices, and they started over the next few months uh, to release those documents to the press. And what was eventually discovered is now what we know as Co-Intel Pro, this secret illegal operation that the FBI was taking uh, under the leadership of J. Edgar Hoover. Following Huey Newton's directions, the Lumpen members were assigned new positions within the party and performed for the last time together on May 23, 1971. A few days later, Calhoun, the band leader, left the Panthers altogether. Then, although no longer an official party unit, the other three members played sporadically until they eventually left as well. From the day the group began to sing in Black Panther offices, up until their headlining performances and final days together, the Lumpen had one goal in mind. Although there is no doubt that their dance moves and rhythm were second to none, their overall mission was to communicate the thinking of the Black Panthers and the greater ideas of Black Power. We find